Welcome to season five of the Color Success Podcast, where we talk with guests from AAPI and ethnic minority communities and have real discussions about mental health and what success looks like. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie J. Wong. Before we get into it, remember to subscribe to our mailing list for free at colorsuccesspodcast.com so you don't miss any updates. There, you will find our socials, YouTube channel, and all episodes on streaming platforms for great additional content. I have a very special guest today. Son of Paper has the power. A native of Chinatown, San Francisco, Son of Paper is not only used to intersections of culture, language, and genre, he thrives in them. From introspective R&B projects to biting rap singles like Mr. Chinatown and Overcame off his forthcoming debut album from a rooftop in Chinatown, the 25-year-old rapper continues to be a dynamic and innovative artist exploring Asian American identity. Welcome, welcome. I have my second rapper on the show, Son of Paper. How's it going? It's going really well. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I mean, we're both San Franciscans natives, like tell me about the San Francisco pride, the Chinatown pride, like it means so much to you. Yeah, for sure. Both um, myself, my brother, uh, my mom as well, and even my my grandma, and then also my, my a couple of my great grandparents also grew up basically in San Francisco and Oakland. So this is kind of like our home. Um, and uh, especially on my mom's side, the Chinese American side, we we love San Francisco. Uh, yeah, uh, and and Chinatown specifically has a big history for us, um, and I think it's pretty amazing that it's still a neighborhood that is that is thriving and struggling to be better always, um, and has this like long immigrant history for Chinese America. So, um, yeah, just uh. Just, just, just love, love Chinatown, love San Francisco, and it, it kind of has become more meaningful to me as I kind of came back uh, after college and started becoming more involved in nonprofit work, and now I'm here making music <laughs> about about Chinatown as well. So, the fun fact for me is my mom grew up in Chinatown in a one bedroom. They had to share a bathroom with like the whole floor. So I'm wondering if you can kind of paint a picture of what it looks like in, you know, what your memories, but also like how you've seen it progress or not over the years. Well, um, I I grew up in the outer Richmond district. Um, and so my experience with Chinatown has always been traveling back and forth between it. Um, every Sunday, I would go to the Presbyterian church on mm-hmm. uh, on Stockton. And, uh, and also Cameron house is, is like the really, um, was the crucial physical location as well as where I gained a lot of leadership skills and even a sense of Asian American identity since my school and my, all the sports and all the extracurriculars I was doing was there were much more white worlds. Um, and so Chinatown is where I like learned about who I was and where I came from. So, um. Yeah, in, in a sense, uh, I think just the just like those brick buildings and um, just like the really long history of so many leaders coming through Cameron House being being a safe. I, I've been calling it a, a haven on a hill. So mm-hmm. I think that's that's what Chinatown is to me. And 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 um, uh, yeah, uh, just like always running around with friends and eating in the, the different restaurants and. Um, yeah, even though I, I can't speak Cantonese, I like it feels so familiar, it feels so warm to me. Yeah, my mom actually went through Cameron House and her her siblings, and I credit them with making sure that she wasn't a total delinquent <laughs> throughout her youth. Um, but she'll she'll have a you know, she'll definitely laugh when she hears this piece. But I think there's so many aspects that the community tries to be protective and encourage youth within the city or I would call it a little city even though it's not very big comparatively but its Mm -hmm. own little area and really trying to be protective of all all its um, residents and all all the visitors as well so um, we'll get more into kind of where it it has gone and how to and the protection piece 
Um, but tell me what really inspired you from having a warm spot in your heart about Chinatown in the city and then taking it to that next step of saying, hey, I'm going to express myself and rap about it. I think um, it took me a while to get to that place. But honestly, very early on, I wanted to claim that history. I, I wanted to tell my family story. Um, and so, yeah, in 20, <laughs> what year was it? 2016, uh, I, I chose the name Son of Paper to um, honor the paper son, paper daughter history. And and um, for those that don't know, um, it's, it's kind of about uh, talking about how difficult it was to immigrate into the States during Chinese exclusion, which happened from 1882 all the way through 1965. And so it's just like this insane history that I don't think everyone knows about. Um, but uh, one of the only ways to get around this pretty racist quota was to buy a paper. And so um, uh, I think my artistry and, and me just having that name, it just kind of keeps that history alive a little bit. And when people ask about it, I, I love to tell them and they always are shocked and uh, uh, they, they kind of see the like onion <laughs> of being an artist and see like, oh, there's actually like lots of layers to what he's trying to do. So it's been cool. Absolutely. And I think it helps with, in terms of understanding that historical piece, right? And I read recently Shanghai Girls and, um, you know, it it really gave that historical piece of coming to America and having to face these barriers and the, the fear of having a paper. And, and so tell me about how you communicate that fear and also that hope of being a, a citizen or being considered a citizen. I think, um, you know, as a person that was born here, um, uh, my Korean side, my dad's side, uh, he, he's, he was naturalized already by the time that I was born. So like, to me, like citizen citizenship was always a given. So it's yeah. it's kind of like not a direct experience of um, that fear and hope. But I think I'm a very like emotionally like just attuned with what's happening around me. And so I felt I felt it um, just seeing like Muslim people and Latinx people really being mistreated in a very similar way that Chinese people used to be treated. Um, and then, and so to me, it's actually no surprise that all this anti-Asian violence stuff is happening um, as a result of pandemic, right? Because that's yeah. that's how our our when we first came into the country, there were very similar anti-Chinese sentiment related to disease. So to me, like having studied that and having heard the oral histories from my family members, um, learning and being part of like um, Cameron House as well as like the um, Chinatown Rising, the documentary, like just hearing those firsthand oral histories, like um, I was like already mentally prepared for what was going to come. So to me, talking about hope and fear, it's a lot about what I feel in the community and um, trying to put work out that can convey those feelings in a productive way, because I think it's very easy to um, accidentally kind of like knock down others while propping yourself up in a sense. So it's a very fine balance. And, and I think too, there, it's not dichotomous, right? Like you can have fear and you can have hope and, and everything in between. And I think emotions are on a spectrum. So thinking a little bit about one of the huge things is men's mental health. And we're really prioritizing this with one of my colleagues in terms of putting it out there more what do you what is your experience and also your perception of asian american male mental health because there's quite a few challenges yeah um this is this is an awesome topic i it's i feel like it's not really talked about very much even amongst close family and friends um um i i would say i don't even know what the percentages um are for her how many Asian American men, especially like over 30, um, have ever gone to therapy. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, I've been benefited from it immensely. Um, I started going, um, I tried once in high school, didn't really connect with the therapist, but kind of more in college and um, right into the pandemic, I started seeing uh, a couple of different therapists and there were these awesome Asian American women that kind of felt like, like aunties to me. So that was cool. <laughs> and they helped me kind of like uncover this trauma that I talk about. One of my songs called Overcame. It is, it's like a, a muscle or almost like a language kind of in my experience. Um, it's like if you don't ever dive deep and try to explore like what the root cause of certain behaviors are, then it's really hard to like ever get there or like have to have feel comfortable getting there um, and ever work on it. So uh, I'm very grateful for my experience in therapy. And I think it's helped a lot. It's actually like it helped make this album. It helped make help make me better art and music um because i was able to have open and comfortable dialogue with myself it's a catharsis for sure where you're putting in all the things that you've learned out there because i imagine that there's a level of vulnerability that you weren't able to touch before kind of like delving deeper into some of these topics absolutely yeah so tell me how you got though from going to therapy in high school to then saying, Hey, I want to work on myself because I think that's the barrier that we're always trying to overcome or at least address for many Asian Americans, especially um, males who are like, no way, I'm not going to talk about my emotions. Like what prompted you and gave you that extra push to actually go and do the work? I'm trying to go back in time as, (laughs) as you asked that question. Um, I think it's definitely related to like failed romantic relationships primarily as well as like feel the the sense of like I don't have male mentors um that look like me and wondering why that was so it was like a wondering and also like a feeling sad heartbroken um and trying to process really the fear of the unknown as well as just confusion on like why I was feeling certain feelings. Mm -hmm. So that's what prompted it. And yeah, I definitely, I just feel like now I just see like threads. A big step was telling my family, uh, my immediate family about like what had happened to me as a kid um, with this act of violence that this, this assault that happened to me um, when I was a a teenager. Um, And, and also how that related to how, I viewed my position in the family, how my brother with depression, how uh, I didn't, I, I wasn't, I wasn't able to tell my parents in the past because I, I wanted them to focus their energy on him. So mm. that it was the point actually that made me first cry about it um, and kind of mourn that loss of innocence, I guess, or that loss of um, that sense of duty and responsibility that I had kind of unfairly placed upon myself. So well, um, thank, thank you for sharing that because this is what one of the points that I would like a lot of families to really understand, because I, when I see a person usually in more like on the youth side of things or young adulthood and their parents encourage them to come or they bring them to session, they're like, this is kind of like the quote unquote dysfunctional or problem child. And then I'm like, Hey, what about the sibling or siblings? because everyone plays a role in the family. There's family dynamics there. And it's not to say if this person is not causing all the noise or the attention is not drawn to them, that that person is not impacted. In fact, the other sibling tends to feel the need to have more perfectionistic tendencies. Like I'm not gonna cause my parents or my family any more heartache or issues or whatnot. And that is a huge, huge burden to place on yourself at such a young age. Yeah. Um, I, I never heard it described in that way, but that makes a lot of sense. And like, yeah, I definitely have always just tried to be so independent. So like self-sufficient. Um, so yeah, that's sounds good. Sounds right to me. <laughs> well, you got that for free today. So you're welcome. <laughs> what was that conversation like? And you don't have to put it all out there if you don't want to, but what was that conversation like when you were telling your parents this information? Because that's another layer of vulnerability. Going to therapy is one thing because it's a safe space, 
And then going and talking to your family about it is another. The conversation was pretty epic. Um, I, I don't <laughs> mind sharing. Um, so, okay. Imagine we have this big round white table. Um, this table is like literally from like my mom's childhood home. So it's like, I don't know, it's a special table. Um, we're sitting in the dining room in my, in my childhood home. And uh, I think we're just eating quietly. <laughs> And then I just I was like, hey, I, I, I want, I, can I share something? And they all look up um, and I start telling them the story um, because the key part of the story is that none of them were there. None, they were all out of the country, actually. Oh, wow. Okay. When this happened. And so there is this couple, like just some triggers, like them being gone, it being really dark and late at night, me being alone. Um, and uh I remember they all had very interesting responses, very different responses to this um, this trauma. trauma. Yeah. So my my brother was just kind of sad and quiet and just listening intently. Um, and and he's 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 all he's he's flourishing now. So good. Uh, that's it's it's uh, we have a very great close relationship. Um, my my father he was very angry and he really wanted to exact revenge against this, um, this white man. He was, uh, the, a father. Uh, so he was in his forties and at the time. And so, uh, you know, just so gross and so, um, irresponsible and immature of him to do. So my dad was just like, where is where do they live? Let's go get revenge, which <laughs> was, you know, but, it, but it it's was, a parental reaction though to your child being being hurt for sure and that that was the response uh, we obviously didn't do anything but like it was the great response to hear knowing that yeah. my dad wanted to physically stick up for me um because i never really saw him as like a protector or like really masculine and um so that was great to hear um and then my mom being the like very emotionally like intelligent person that she is she just said wow like that's so terrible what do you need like what what can we do for you now to make you feel better so mm -hmm. yeah those were the three reactions wow that that really is so wonderful to have that re the message received in such a way and what what a nice compliment too cuz it I imagine that if all three of them were like, let's go kick some ass, <laughs> you're like, whoa, let's call, you know, let's talk about this some more. But that mm -hmm. that compliment of emotional intelligence, the, you know, the the sadness and it 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 showed the spectrum of emotion. So mm -hmm. that's that's fantastic. Do you feel like that brought your family closer together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there was like a lot of unspoken things throughout the years um as we kind of try to support my brother through his depression um, and me choosing. And then also this like weird unknown of me choosing such a uh, financially <laughs> unstable career path. So yeah. And, and, and this was like literally like beginning of pandemic. So just like we were forced to be together and yeah. um, that allowed, yeah, that um, created space and opportunity for the sharing to happen. Well, let's get to that piece, right? You've chosen to go into music and, um, uh, you know, one, you know, I talk about BTS on every episode, but, you know, Kim Nam Joon or RM just released his album from, and I'm not, I know I'm a little biased, but from track one to 10, oh man, it is so dope. Closer, um, you know, Paul Blanco, all that. And I already see when you're talking, you even have that like rapper style as you are giving the interview. So, but tell me a little bit about what was it like to make that decision to go into music and what was that conversation like with your family? So I, I've been making music since I was 15. So it's always been a part of my being and my expression. And um, it really like just gave me a voice, like, and it allowed me to say everything I wanted to, especially in rap. You can like, it's just in the culture. It's in like, it's literally like, it's like, way more dense than like a pop song like you can fit more words in more thoughts um and there's a lot, lot less emphasis on perfection mm -hmm. so 
I've like released like 60 different songs over the years, you know, um, and really like had a very grassroots approach, um, performing a lot. So it, it's always been this awesome, joyful experience for me without like before college, I didn't even think about, oh, I'm going to be a rapper. I just kind of like made songs I thought were really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think every writer um, wants to share it too, or to an, a certain extent. So um, yeah, uh, not until uh, until maybe 2019 did I decide, okay, I'm going to try to, this could be a business. This could actually turn into a career. Um, and so it was really rough. <laughs> Pandemic hit. It was really like, I was so unsure where the money was going to come from now that live performance was kind of out the window. Right. So really telling my parents, like, like, you know, give me two to three years. Let, let, like I, I will grow this business. I need to just get better as a, as a, um, performing, uh, like uh, recording myself, like getting good at, um, all the parts that I wasn't actually that strong at. Um, and I had relied on other people for, so learning how to mix and master, um, and somehow trying to figure out a way to, to network and, and build up my brand and sense of identity, like from my home, you know? So it just, it was just so uncertain, but I am so grateful because it actually forced me to stay in SF. I was going to move to LA to pursue music, but I'm here in SF still. And I started going to Chinatown events uh, as things started to slightly slowly reopen. And I did, I did um, like marches. I, I've done like, uh, I was there for the Michelle Go vigil mm-hmm. and just like lots of Chinatown events and everyone started to hear about what I was doing. And um, just that feeling of being in community and being seen and been, be giving a stage to like tell stories. Um, that's when I started writing the album from Rooftop in Chinatown. Uh, a little bit after that. Well, I have a couple, the COS alumni that I'll definitely link you to. Uh, I can think of a few and I think it'll be really great because I mean, Kev Lou, he's in the music industry and really a huge, the thing that gets me about Kev is like just so giving and he's, he's in LA, but he does so many um, marches, grassroots organizing, um, and someone who struggled with bipolar disorder throughout his life and um, really how how he's been able to manage that. And so um, he's one. And I'm, the other rapper that was on the show was Alan Z and he's killing it right now. So I think those are some great people to connect with. But at any rate, music is there's a creative side and there's also that business side. And so it's really, really hard because everyone is a brand now. <laughs> and it's just kind of like, navigating that piece but what are your aspirations what do, what would it look like for you to feel successful mm. well i just listened to your pod your podcast earlier with um i don't remember their names but they were the like marriage counselor um, oh the clovers yeah yes the clovers yeah so just hearing them talk about success was really interesting and like defining it for yourself um as a way to like feel like you've act, like actually feel like you've reached it and versus you know what society de- determines as successful mm-hmm. so I, I love i love that concept um shout out to that episode uh, but for me just like some form of financial stability would be great um i think this is going to be a big year of growth in 2023 um and I want to be able to sustain myself and also pay my team that I've been able to build um, like so that they can sustain themselves too. So it's kind of like, uh, that's kind of step one for me. Um, and I think from there, from then on, I, I, I would feel just happy um, uh, working with artists that I respect and love. So um right now i think at my at my current stage still very much emerging um i don't have the i guess like pull to work with anyone i want to um so it's it feels a little bit like creatively limiting so um uh developing that and making a name for myself in the bay and, and then 
just branching out from there uh, is a joy and it's a challenge, but I feel prepared for it. Um, yeah, as, as just a former camera house kid that is um, trying to build bridges between communities um, and having a great time with, with awesome people. Your heart's in the right place. And, you know, similar, similar notion, right? It's like, as this thing grows, I would like this, this is all community work here. Like the podcast that, you know, putting things out there and um, just being able to continue to give back um, despite what that, what that may look like. But, you know, we have to be honest with people that it's difficult. Like finances are a huge part of what we do. I mean, fortunately I make money in other ways, but it, it is a reality of doing creative work and, and building something meaningful. But I, I just see so much uh, brightness in you and so much, um, you're so um, driven. And I think that that's what's gonna to keep you through is that at the heart of everything, knowing your why is just so important because hopefully we all have a very long life to live. And as the Kluvers mentioned, it's not a one-stop destination, right? Like even though um, Chris had the cars, the house, whatever, whatever, he didn't feel fulfilled. And um, that's part of the stereotypical Asian way, right? Is that we make a certain amount of money, we buy a house, we have the family, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I guess just thinking a little bit about your why and, and letting it continue to push you through is just so important. For sure. Um, one thing I'm, I'm trying to explore as well um, is teaching um, and teaching. Like I actually, I currently teach chess to kids as one of my part-time. Amazing. Hustles. Okay. I'll send my kids over to you. <laughs> I'll be awesome. Um, uh, but I also want to teach um, hopefully the current work I'm doing and kind of teach about, uh, you know, sense of neighborhood, sense of like identity and history um through creative writing rap and spoken word um so i'm hoping I'm, I'm like currently in talks with a couple of different nonprofits and applying for grants to do that um as a way just to like like i mean that's honest to me like i only really want fame so that i can spread like what i'm doing you know with the wider net and like hopefully have like really positive social influence. Um, but I'd also be equally happy if I just have more quality of connection too and and be working like six to 12 weeks with kids sounds really dope to me too. So I'm I'm trying to like find balance um, as my business is expanding, but also like not ever drifting too far away from center. Yeah. Well, that really excited me to hear you talk about the his historical piece. So I've, I've constantly... Um, had this this balance of like so um assembly member evan lowe um, was on the show for the finale and he was talking about it will be required that there will be ethnic studies asian american history being taught at the high school level that's a huge area to really explore but i think that you have such a um, market here and a demographic for kids to be really hungry and their parents to be hungry for that historical piece, because I struggle with that, right? Like they, they're teaching them about the gold rush. And I said, well, did they teach you about the um, Asian, the Asians that worked on the railroad and like paid them really cheap? And they're like, no. And so I'm that, I'm that annoying parent. I'm like, I don't want my kids dressing up as the colonialist. Okay. And I, I still, they haven't had to do it yet, but I'm, I'm like, oh God, can we just skip that? Like, I don't even, I don't even want to do that. Yeah, it's it's like in a really weird way. It's like the perfect timing for like what my um my my I think my career aspirations are. It's like strangely weird, perfect timing, and also like they're they're also I'm not even the first to to try to do be an Asian American rapper, which is also like very assuring, <laughs> knowing that I don't have to trailblaze everything that I can be thankful for. Artists like Dumbfounded, MC Jin, like. Aquafina, like everyone, like so. Um, I'm feeling like um 
I, I actually had an epic conversation with my grandma last night. Um, she's my high money. So my, my mom on my, my dad's side. Mm-hmm. Um, and she kept saying this word in Korean. I was like, it sounds so familiar, but I didn't know what I had to like Google it later. Um, the word is unmyung, which means like destiny or fate. Mm-hmm. And, um, I was telling her, she's like, she always points out like physical ailments of mine. She's like, you're, you know, one of your eyes is bigger than the other. It's because <laughs> it's because you're really stressed and tired, right? I was like, yeah, I guess that's right. And then she's like, like, she was saying, she always like wants to discourage me from doing music because it's a hard, hard life. And, um, and I always thought it was about the finances part, but she was like, don't worry about the finances. Just don't even be stressed. Like if you're going to do it, just do it. Like I already, I've already gone to the fortune teller and she told me that your destiny is to be rich and successful and famous. So why are you being stressed? That's so pointless. Mm. And I was just like, really like shaken in in a great way. Um, it was awesome because I always thought it was about the money part but she just doesn't want me to suffer. Right. And mm-hmm. she already knows that I'm going to be able to do what I'm doing. I just need to relax a little bit. <laughs> you know, that, that is so touching. And I think when we get a validation from our loved ones, that's the ultimate gift that they could give back. And I think when you have those conversations together, you're able to understand more of the context because essentially when parents say that they want you to get a stable job, that's what the fear is, right? And as a parent, I understand, and uh, I'm not by any means this tiger parent, but I understand the the wish to for them to be able to take care of themselves when we're gone, right? And so, um, but what your grandma gave you is this idea of, she essentially said, take care of your mental health without saying that, right? Yeah. So, um, this has been such an amazing talk and I know we're going to continue talking offline and don't forget the little people um, when you do blow up to this level that, you know, your grandma's talking about for Un Myung. Um, so what, where can people find your music? Tell us all about those fun marketing details. <laughs> sure. Sure. So, you know, my, my artist name is son of paper and you can find all my stuff at son of paper, S O N O F P A P E R. And um, the album is called From a Rooftop in Chinatown. And um, I'm actually going to have a rooftop concert um, at the at Cameron House um, on February 18th or 19th, depending on the rain. Um, and I, I, I want to invite you to it. Oh, it'll be so fun. And yeah, anyone that's listening, um, there will be tickets that will be offer based. So you can kind of offer how much um, you're able to afford and how much you think it's worth. And we will, um, you know, write you back. And uh, yeah, the album should be out. Very <laughs> exciting for me. We've been working on it for about a year, like about a year start to finish. Um, so I'm just excited to have everyone listen to it, take a listen. And um, even if you can't make the rooftop concert, I think the album will take you there kind of if you close your eyes and listen to it cover to cover. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. And it's just been so fun learning about your history and your journey. And again, you're going to continue to rise. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in. Remember to support us for free by subscribing to our mailing list at colorsuccesspodcast.com. There you will find our socials, YouTube channel, and all episodes on streaming platforms for great additional content. As Rob Heaps from Partner Track said, success is contagious, so come catch it.